Well, welcome. This is our Apollo to the Moon gallery. Uh, this is an original gallery to the museum. Uh, when this was uh, put together, this was actually Michael Collins, who was the command module pilot for Apollo 11, was the director of this museum when it was being built. Um, and was in very instrumental in putting this together. So at the time when this building opened in 1976, this was really a current events gallery. This is uh, the Apollo missions had only just ended in 1972. Um, and so we see around us a, real, a tribute to the technology and to the men who went on the missions to the moon between uh, 1968 and 1972. And so this week is the anniversary of the April 1970 mission, the 40th anniversary of Apollo 13 which was intended to be the third landing on the moon. Apollo 11 had obviously been the first landing on the moon in July of 1969 with Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin landing. And then Apollo 12 had followed that mission. And the real difference of what they were going to do with Apollo 13 with the complexity of the mission was supposed to be around the landing site. With Apollo 11 and 12, as I understand it, they had landed in relatively easy, flat landing spaces, uh, which were good for guaranteeing a safe landing uh, on a very, very dangerous mission, uh, but not tremendously geologically interesting in terms of the moon. So the plan for Apollo 13 was to land in a, a more geologically interesting site on the moon, uh, which would mean a more complex landing. And so the team, the prime crew for Apollo 13, had trained uh, for working as a team and being able to pilot both the command module and the lunar module on Apollo 13. And that prime crew was going was uh, Commander Jim Lovell, and then command module pilot Ken Mattingly, and then lunar module pilot Fred Hayes. So Lovell and Hayes would have been the fifth and sixth men on the moon. Um, but as many of you know, Things did not, the complexity of the mission did not turn out to be the landing site for Apollo 13 because uh, there were a number of issues and they really show themselves when we look at the memorabilia. And that's really my specialty here is thinking about how are these things remembered. And one of the ways that missions like this are remembered um, is the, actually the astronauts wanted to have souvenirs that no one else could have. They wanted to have some things that were special to them. And so um, my lovely assistant, actually, if you'll remove this, uh, Hunter Hollins, who is our loan officer here at the museum, has uh, kindly agreed to uh, serve as my lovely assistant for the day. Um, the Robbins Company is a company that, had, that made medallions. Um, and this is a Robbins medallion that Hunter can show you. Uh, they're small, about an inch or so in diameter, but they're made specially for the astronaut office. Uh, they would usually be made in silver or gold. The silver ones, they would have meant more of them. There would be very few of the gold ones that were minted. The gold ones were often considered the wives medallions because uh, they would often be uh, purchased by the astronauts to give to wives or family, someone close to them, and then the silver ones would become more readily available. They are uh, numbered on the back. Um, they are stamped with a small R that is the symbol of the Robbins Company. And they typically have a design that has the mission emblem, the mission patch, which was designed by the astronauts themselves on the front and on the back. Then they would have the names of the crew and the various relevant dates for that. And they are all numbered. And so if you know, if you see the serial number on a Robbins medallion, you will know whether they were flown or not. So many of these uh, were flown on the missions. They would go actually to the moon and back. And then <clears throat> they would be engraved in the back with the launch date, the moon landing date, and then the return date on the back. Uh, well, there are a few complicated, this really becomes a central piece for me because this becomes a very complicated piece of memorabilia for Apollo 13 because two days before the mission, they figured out that um, Charlie Duke, who was on the backup crew for Apollo 13, one of his children developed German measles which meant that he had exposed not only the backup crew, but the prime crew to German measles. And it turned out that everyone on the cruise had either had German measles or had the antibodies, except for Ken Mattingly. And Ken Mattingly was scheduled to be the command module pilot. And they, the doctors said, you know, he's within the incubation period. It's very likely that if he's been exposed, if he's going to develop German measles, it would happen during the mission. Um, he cannot fly. 
And so Jim Lovell as the commander was left with the decision of what to do. His initial suggestion was we'll fly him anyway. That we are an, a, a cohesive crew, we've worked together. We know from tone of voice what, we're th what each of us are thinking. Um, Fred Hayes and Ken Mattingly were particularly close. They had come up in the astronaut corps together. Um, they were devastated at the idea that um, Mattingly obviously devastated that he was not gonna be able to fly, but Hayes also that he was not gonna be able to fly with someone he really saw as a partner in the astronaut corps. Um, and so Lovell's initial suggestion was if he gets German measles, he'll probably get it on the flight home. <laughs> we would have done all the hard stuff, just let him fly. And of course, the NASA doctors said, no way, no how. Um, and so they ended up only a couple of days before the mission putting Jack Swigert, who was the backup command module pilot, onto the prime crew. And Ken Mattingly ended up staying on the ground. He never, in fact, developed German measles. Um, but it turned out, because of other events that eventually happened, it uh, was not an altogether bad thing to have a member of the prime crew who really knew this crew and knew this mission inside and out on the ground. Um, but for something like this kind of a medal, which is engraved ahead of time and which contains the names of all of the flight crew, this means that this was the first reason that they realized they were going to have to re-strike these medals after they had come back from the moon. So I can pass around so that you can get a look at it. I've got a few copies of the back of an Apollo 13 Robbins medal, and then for comparison, a few copies of the back of an Apollo 11 Robbins medal. Now, the second thing that happened on this mission, um, which is what part of what makes it so famous, um, is that two days into the flight on the 13th of April for Apollo 13, they stirred the cryogenic tanks that held the oxygen and they ended up with an explosion in one of those tanks. Uh, what had happened, the tank in being tested before the flight had not been draining properly and they had then boiled off the oxygen in order to empty it completely. They did this a couple of times and unknowingly then um, boiled off uh, the heat created in there, uh, melted away some of the insulation on some of the electronics. So when they went to the moon, they unknowingly had a faulty tank that when they um, started up the electronics to stir the liquid oxygen that was inside it, it created an explosion. Jim Lovell has said that there were two of these that were identical. And in retrospect, he really regrets that instead of asking for the new one to be installed, they stuck with its idiot twin and uh, flew to the moon with that. And the explosion actually took out part of the service module, which is the back of the command module, which holds all of the uh, propellant and, um, um, and also the, the supplies. And um, they started venting gas into the air and it became very quickly clear within an hour or so that um, this was not an instrumentation problem. They weren't getting bad data back that in fact there had been a catastrophic uh, event in the service module and that what they would need to do was shut down the command module, move into the lunar module and use it as a lifeboat to come back. The lunar landing was scrubbed, was not going to be a part of the mission, um, and it really became a mission about getting these three men back. Um, moving into a vehicle that had been planned to hold two men for two days, it now needed to hold three men for four days. And all of the technological problems that came out around that uh, really have become very famously part of the story of Apollo 13 as a successful failure, and one that really showcases the teamwork. Uh, we have over here the white vest that Gene Krantz wore as the mission controller, uh, famously on Apollo 13. And really it was not only an effort between the folks on board the ship um, but and the folks at Mission Control in Houston, but also out in uh, Downey, California, in Bethpage, New York, all of the places where they had built the components that were part of this. Um, they had engineers who were working on solving a whole variety of problems that needed to be solved in order to get these astronauts back safely. Um, but it means that we end up with some very unusual pieces of memorabilia, because if I can take this from Hunter, on the, the front of this has the mission patch, which um, you conveniently did not have the names of the three astronauts embroidered on it. So the mission patches have actually stood as they were. They were designed um, 
by the crew. They have a symbol of uh, three horses pulling a chariot going to the moon and uh, a play on the naval um, motto, uh, which was ex tridens scientia. My Latin pronunciation is probably awful. Um, the nuns would be horrified. Um, to ex luna scientia. So rather than from the ocean or from the sea knowledge, now from the moon knowledge. And so emphasizing the increased scientific uh, knowledge that they hope to get from going to this more complex landing site. So the mission patch on was able to stay the same and the front of the metal was able to stay the same, but the back of these metals had to be changed almost entirely because not only did you have a different crew member, so the, when these were on the actual ship and when they were being flown to the moon, they still said Ken Mattingly, um, but in fact they had three places for engraving for the launch date, for the landing date on the moon, and then for the return date. And of course, when these came back, they ended up being all being sent back to the Robbins Company and being completely redesigned so that they now carry a launch and then a land a return date, but no um, <coughs> no land no lunar landing date. And instead, they put Aquarius and Odyssey, the names of the two vehicles, the command module and the lunar module, on the back. Now, the last piece that I wanted to show you, and this is something um, folks were asking, you know, it's nice to get to see things that are not on display, but why don't we have these things on display, especially given that this is the 40th anniversary? Um, and this is a very unusual piece. This is a dollar bill um, that is signed and actually is more than just a memento, but in fact is proof of the flight. Um, and we don't have this on display because if we put this out under the lights so that you can all see it, eventually all of our signatures are going to fade and we will have ruined an artifact. Um, but the NAA, which was the uh, organization in the United States that was basically the record-keeping organization, needed a simple, elegant way to prove that when you had flown up to the moon and you had come back that, in fact, this was the same vehicle. And one of the ways that they did that is they took a, a pristine dollar bill and right before the flight they had the flight crew sign it. So this is one where we don't have to worry about change signatures because we have Hayes, Lovell, and Swigert who've all signed it. And then you'll see on the other side of the bill that we have three signatures um, that come from NASA officials and NAA officials depending on who was there. And they would then fly this dollar bill on the mission, when they came back and they opened up the capsule again, and it's still there with the signatures, then you've authenticated that this is in fact the same vehicle that went up and came back. It's a rather uh, simple way of putting this together, and we have a collection upstairs then of dollar bills from the Gemini and from the Apollo flights that carry these signatures, uh, sometimes two or three signatures from the authorizing official, um, but then always the signatures of the crew, which was not just a little memento, but in fact a way that we they were able to actually record that the flight had done what they said it was, or at least that it was the very same people and the same craft coming back that had been launched. Um, and so this uh, was held and then transferred to the museum as one way of demonstrating the authenticity of these flights. Um, and so what I wanted to bring out today was a few of these little pieces one made especially for the astronaut office so that they could have their own special ways of remembering the flight. The other, the mission patch, which gave the mission that sense, uh, was one of the physical emblems of the cohesion and the, of that mission. Um, and that is something that has become widely available and very collectible for the public. Many people, if they go to watch a mission or participate in it, will have a mission patch. Um, and then the rather unique signed dollar bill, which was actually used as an official way of comm not just commemorating the mission, but actually authenticating the flight. Thank you for listening to this edition of Ask an Expert. A companion question and answer session for this lecture may also be available. For a schedule of upcoming Ask an Expert lectures at the museum, please visit www.nasm.si.edu.